Good morning, Hope Center. How are you today? Come on, stand up and walk around. I see some new faces out there. Greet them and let them know how much we care about them. Come on, walk out of your normal area and say hello. God bless you. We love you. Welcome all our friends that watch us on the internet. We want you to know how special you are and how much we care about you. God loves you and so do us, so do we. It's Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day. We wanna celebrate what God has done in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is truly awesome. He reigns in majesty above from the Crystal Ballroom of the Anaheim Marriott Suites Hotel. It's the Hope Center of Christ. With Pastor Sheila Schuler Coleman. Pastor Jim Penner. And Pastor Harold Shaw. mothers yes. and happy mother's day to all of you who have mothers yeah, so that's happy mother's day to all of us Hi, that's right yeah. you know i've got to say today is the very best mother's day i'll ever have not ever but for so far i'm sure i'll have others just as good why this is my first mother's day as a grandmother to be Aww. oh yeah you know, and I'm kind of old. To I've waited a long time to have grandbabies. <laughs> but I had my children when I was older, and they're doing the same thing. They're having their grandbabies, or their babies when they're older. So you know, it's uh, that's how it works. Not a bad thing. We've had to be patient. But I'm excited. My son Chris and Melissa are expecting our first grandchild in September, and uh, so you know, thank the Lord for that. But good news. I also have a nest again. No. You know, we moms need our nest, don't we? Me too. We need our nest. Well. And as I was fretting because we'd sold our home and we and we had the escrow hadn't closed on that home and we still hadn't found our home and then God showed us this perfect home. But meanwhile, while I was fretting and going back and forth, Jim, I overheard my sweet, wonderful husband saying to somebody, Sheila's missing her nest. No. So I have a nest again. I haven't moved into it yet. In three weeks we move in, but escrow has closed. Yeah. Escrow closed. And I have another big announcement that I'm gonna share just before my message, but I just want to say today, what a blessing it is to know we have a home. And some of us have roofs over our head. Amen. And some of us don't. Yeah. Yeah. But we all have a home. Regardless of whether there's a roof over your head or not, we all have a home. Yes. Yes. When Jesus is in our life, Thank you, Lord. we all have a home. Yes. As I'm going to talk about later today, John 14 Verse 1 says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in the Father. I have prepared a room for you in this mansion of mine. An escrow has closed on that home. We all have a home. So, Lord God Almighty, we thank you today. We celebrate mothers. 
and we celebrate you who give life. We celebrate you. We find our home in you, our home here on earth and our home for eternity. Therefore, we do not ever have to have our hearts be troubled about anything. We have hope centered in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hear now our songs of adoration. Hear us as we worship you and thank you. We just want to say, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We want to bless the Lord. We want to say hallelujah. We want to worship the Lord this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. He is a good God and he loves us. Hallelujah. in your life. 
He will be faithful. Do you believe that this morning? His word is true. Great, great is his faithfulness. Oh, I love this song. I love this hymn. Sing it with us. Great is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. Thank you. in our lives. When we look at you, we can walk on water. The minute we take our eyes off of you, we start to sink. But all we have to do is lift our eyes and look at you, and it does not matter what's going on around us. The storms can rage, and we can be at perfect peace walking on water because our eyes are upon you. Lord God, I ask your blessing, a very special blessing. Sweep across this room, every soul here, every soul watching, 
feel yes. your presence in a new yes. way, yes. in a fresh way. Praise lift out despair, yes. lift out suffering, Hallelujah. give provision, yes. grant your blessings because you are an able, faithful God. In Jesus' precious name, everyone here said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. You sang very closely to what it says in Psalm 103, which says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Sometimes we need to be reminded of God's benefits. Amen. And Psalm 103 is going to remind us right now, forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals you of all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Thank Who you, crowns you Thank with you, loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I don't care how old you are here today, you are young in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. O my soul. O my soul. And all that is within me. Amen. Bless his holy name. Bless May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Jesus is the light of the world. Do you believe that? A quick scripture. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have a great light. And because he is the light of the world, you are the light of the world because he dwells within you. And that light shines throughout the whole world. Do you believe that the light of Jesus is in you if you know him today? Yes. What? Yes. What? Yes. Amen. He's the light. Hallelujah.
is the light of the world. Amen. Amen. He's the light and the life. Hallelujah. And thank you, Debbie, because we are truly connected with that light Good. and that life. Amen. Amen. So all things are possible because of that. I like to say good morning and happy Mother's Day to those mothers and to those to be. Amen. All right. First of all, I'd like to just share with you that this is a time of, in our service where we prepare for our tithes and for our offerings. Is that okay, Pastor Sheila? Okay. Amen. <laughs> She's my boss. <laughs> Oh, God is the boss. Boy, you guys are always correcting me when I come up here. My goodness. Okay, so in the program, we have these orange cards. Whether you filled out one or not, please let me see it. Wave it back to me. All right, this is the way that we stay connected with you. If you have not received an email from us, it's probably because we are still trying to organize a little better so that we can stay in contact with you. But it is our sincere desire that we'll be able to contact each and every one of our members in our church. So if you filled out one before and you have not heard from us, please feel free to fill it out again. Some of you may not have filled it out because you didn't have an ink pen or a pencil, and we have both. Which do you prefer? <laughs> because we're going to take about 60 seconds, and I'm going to ask Alberto if he would play something on the piano while you fill these cards out. If you need a pencil or a pen, raise your hand, and someone will bring a pencil or a pen to you. Okay? But please fill these cards out. Uh, we want to know your prayer request. What's on your heart? What do you need prayer for? How do you want to serve in the kingdom of God? You can put that on that blank. Is, that a, is there a particular ministry that you want to be involved in? Or a particular ministry that you want to create in the Hope Center of Christ? Because we're not this building. We are the people of Christ. We are the church. Okay? So, Albert. Alberto. Give me some volume and some piano while they are filling out the cards.
Also, I just have a couple of more announcements. Thank you very much, worship team. You. You're awesome. You. All right. We love to worship the Lord at Hope Center of Christ. Wherever we find ourselves, we will always worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. So as we prepare for our tithes and offerings, let me, let me ask that you put a little bit more in your tithes and offerings because we're going to step up. We're going to step up the size of our church, our congregation, and so we need to be ready. We need to walk in faith. So if you can, please do. If you can't, don't worry about it. Uh, God will provide. Also, the Chili Van is coming up next Saturday, which will be May 18th. And we're going to be at the Garden Grove Towers. So if you like serving, come on out and have a fun day serving with the Chili Van. Also, I'm going to be uh, asking you to serve in other capacities. So be prepared. Where's my little salt shaker at? Oh, there she is right there, my, my little salt shaker. That's the way we greet every Sunday, right? So we're going to get the salt shakers going again because there's a need. Also, I still encourage you to bring your children to Sunday school here. We have a wonderful Sunday school. So get your kids out to Sunday school. Give them the whole armor of God so that when you're not there to defend for them, they know that they have their Heavenly Father that will always defend for them, right? And I know that we have prayer needs in our congregation. I read and Pastor Sheila read and others read your prayer needs. So we know you have prayer needs and we're praying for you. I know there's families here right now that have lost loved ones and there's also people that have uh, military people in harm's way and we want to remember them all the time. So whether or not I've read your prayer as we prepare for our offering, let's also give thanks to God for the blessings and the protection that he offers us. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, dear Heavenly Father, we say thank you. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you've brought us this far, thus far. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the protection that you pour over our families, those that are with us and struggling, dear Heavenly Father, to have that personal relationship with you. Those that have backslidden, dear Heavenly Father, and don't know if they want to be a part of a church, we pray for them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for our sons and daughters that find themselves in the military and in harm's way. We pray for protection for them, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick and the shut-in. We pray for the sick right now that's in our midst, that dear Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit that is with us today, that it would just fall upon them and heal them, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, those that are without jobs and have lost their jobs, we pray, dear God, that you would open a new door for them, a new way, dear Heavenly Father, for them to provide for themselves and their families. And as they come forth with their tithes and with their offering, that they are so full, dear Heavenly Father, of the joy that they have experienced through you and through your mighty blessings, dear Heavenly Father, that they are willing to give. May they give of their times. May they give of their talent, dear Heavenly Father, as well as their treasure. And dear God, we pray for those and stand with those that have lost loved ones. We pray and like to pray them through, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray, dear God, that those loved ones had a relationship with Jesus Christ. That when we said goodbye, the kingdom of God said welcome and hello, good and faithful servant. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much. We thank you for how you bless Hope Center of Christ, not just with this church room, dear Heavenly Father, but with the church that is yet to come, dear Heavenly Father. We give you the glory for all the blessings, all the blessings. Dear Heavenly Father, change our eyes into new eyes to cause our eyes to open and to see the things that you have for us, the things that you are already providing for us. Give us these new eyes to see. Dear Heavenly Father, and thank you so very much for each and every mother that's here this morning, dear God. For without that mother, where would we be? And dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much. We give you all glory, all honor and praises. And may our worship continue to be, dear Heavenly Father, to you and to you alone, dear Heavenly Father. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. 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 Thank you. I just want to bring a brief testimony before me and Sarah sing this song. Uh, I had a wonderful mother, 
And growing up, I just thought that there was no other mother that was better than my mother. Uh, she was always there for me. She, the best thing of all is she taught me about Jesus. But when I was 22, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And within a week, she was dead. It was the most devastating time in my life. But I just had to hold on and trust the Lord. I got married to Scott, and uh, we tried to have children. And the first time, I had a miscarriage. And the second time, I had a son. I brought him full term, and three days later, he died. And I was devastated again because I thought I was dying to have that mother child relationship that I'd had with my mother. So the Lord blessed me. The Lord spoke to me at Sean's funeral and he said, you're going to have a child. And that was very hard for me to receive because I just put Sean in the ground. That was my son's name. But two years later, I got pregnant and I can tell you that everything about that pregnancy was God. And she's right here, and she's 18 years old. And she has been the joy of my life and Scott's life. So as we celebrate Mother's Day, I know that sometimes some of you, your mothers aren't here. Some of you, you maybe you've lost children as a mother. But I want you to know God is a faithful God. And what he's promised, he will do. And I thank the Lord today for Sarah, because she is truly the blessing of my life.
church of Jesus Christ? Will we, in the house of Jesus Christ, will we serve the Lord? We will serve the Lord at, at Hope Center of Christ. We will serve the Lord. As for me, in the house of God, we will serve the Lord. Thank you, Debbie. And Aunt Renee. Let's not forget Aunt Renee. Right? I hope, I hope Sarah got you a, a happy Mother's Day Aunt Renee card. If she hasn't, there's time to stop on the way home. Okay? What a week. What an amazing week. Thursday afternoon, I, I taught all day Thursday, and I raced home afterwards, after work, and um, met somebody at my home where, let me, I'm going to go back to that, because at 4.30 that afternoon, my husband and I signed the papers that closed the escrow on our houses. So that was a big thing. You know, today, anything can happen, right? So we closed the escrow papers one hour earlier. At 3.30, I met Debbie Lips at my house, and we signed the lease for our new church home. Yes, we did. Can you imagine? Can you imagine one hour we signed the lease for the new church home, and an hour later we signed the escrow papers for our home? Guess what? We're moving the church home. We're moving our personal home the same weekend. <laughs> You know, I, there are times when I say, God, you don't need to have quite so much faith in me. You could just, you know, don't expect quite so much from me, in other words. But yeah, that's my big announcement. You know, we have, as of June 2nd, our permanent new church home. Wow. You know, we prayed and, and asked God, and God said, April. I'm going to open the door in April, right? Is that a, a, I'm looking at Dr. Thomas. Is that a fair, um, okay, I'm getting the, yep. And, and yes, in truth, God did open the door in April. And this week we signed the lease, and get, I want to tell you about our new church home. You want to hear about it? It's a big new church home. Yeah. He didn't give us a little one. He gave us a big one. 12,000 square feet, air conditioned, so exciting, so exciting. You know, he doesn't give you a big church home so for the church to stay small, right? You know, he gives you a big church home because he knows you're going to need it, and we're going to need it. So now, as of June 2nd, we will have storage for all of our equipment we no longer have to load in and out every Sunday. We can have a fellowship place after church. So we can bring potluck and stay. We can come. We are paying right now just for a Sunday morning. And for 50% more, we get this whole church home 24-7, day and night. You know, what an amazing an amazing thing that the Lord has done. So we can come together midweek for Bible study in small groups. We can be a mission outpost. This is really cool. We are two blocks from Mary's Kitchen. If you don't know what Mary's Kitchen is, look it up online. But they feed breakfast and a hot meal in the middle of the day, and they give people a sack meal to take home with them Monday through Saturday. This is Mary's Kitchen. We're two blocks away from Mary's Kitchen. Isn't that cool? Um, yeah, they are currently the, currently the church that is there. And this is their last Sunday. This is their last Sunday today. So we'll pray for them in a moment. Um, but they're currently providing a week's worth of groceries for 40 families. And they call that program, I Was Hungry, after the words of Jesus Christ. I was hungry and you gave me food. You fed me, right? So we will continue that program. We will continue that. They've asked if we would continue. So we would love to. So they're going to actually work with us. Some of them are going to stay and work alongside of us. Some of them may just stay forever and continue that program with us. We can bring the chili van now to our parking lot. We have a parking lot. 
we can build houses for Mexico in our parking lot. We can start a thrift store in our abundance of space. You like that idea? Everybody likes that idea. You know, I, what I like about it is I was sitting there going, okay, God, this is going to cost a little more than we have in our budget. I don't know. This is a real stretch of faith in signing the lease. And then, meanwhile, I'm packing to move to my new house, and I'm looking around. I was blow-drying my hair. I don't know why God gives you ideas when you're blow-drying your hair. And I was looking around my room thinking, what am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? And I thought, oh, throw it away. No, take it to a thrift store, thrift store, thrift, thrift store, thrift store. We'll have enough room for a thrift store. You know what? If we all did a thrift store, that will more than bring in enough revenue to offset any extra cost, and it helps people. It, it's wonderful. Thrift stores are missions. So it's really, uh, it takes the burden of finances, too, off of you guys. That doesn't mean you can't give your tithe anymore because God asks you to do that to him. But just think of the, the new resources that he's providing through that by giving us more enough space to do that because that's usually the big problem with a thrift store is the space. We can do that. We have space for our youth program. We can have special services like Christmas Eve and Good Friday and Passover and Pentecost. We can have prayer rooms for those who need prayer after church. We have plenty of space for the Growing Children's Program. In fact, we're having Vacation Bible School this July. We are. And something I've wanted for a long time is a cry room. You know, a place where moms with young babies can sit and listen and watch, but they, they worry because their baby's crying and maybe interrupting the service. And we've lost a couple families because we didn't have a cry room. And we are going to build a cry room. So we actually have, it's cool, there's actually a right now a closet that kind of comes out into the front of the sanctuary. And we're going to, all it needs is window and some sound piped in. And this week, I got a text that said, Sheila, I'm giving you the double pane windows you need for the cry room. So we will have a cry room. There are already risers built in for our choir. We can control the lighting and backdrop for our televised program. And I like this too. We'll have screens so we can project the words for the music as well as video support for the messages and announcements. Cool? Okay. What do you think? Wow. 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 Look what God has done. Look what God has done. Okay. We get the keys to our new church home Tuesday. Tuesday. Kitchen. Yes, thank you, Julie. You can come and cook. Are you kidding? The church will grow by threefold if they know that Julie is cooking for us in the kitchen. So what is God calling you to do at Hope Center of Christ? This week, Tuesday night, uh, 7 p.m., come and see night. Come and see. Bring coffee and cookies, and we're just going to look around, okay? You don't have to worry about anything, doing, wearing work clothes. You can if you want to. Women, we might want to bring buckets. Men, too, you know, with soap and water. I don't know what we're going to find on Tuesday. Primarily, I want us to get familiar with the space and start, and some of you are going to say, you know what, I think we need to paint this room this color. I think we need to do this here. God will show you as we walk around that and and you know, decide what we're going to do in what rooms. So please come this Tuesday night if you possibly can. Um, but also, we're going to be there several nights and weekends and Saturdays. Um, think about it. Just start asking the Lord, what is it you want me to do? This program, I Was Hungry. I love that. They give meal, they give groceries for a week to 40 families. So Tuesday mornings, there's a food pickup from 10 to 11. Maybe you, you don't work on Tuesday morning. Maybe you want to be part of that. Friday mornings um, from 9.30 to 12.30, again, there's food pickup, but also setup. And Saturday mornings, 8.30 to 11.30, there's food distribution. 
So we have a lot of work to do before between, between now and June 2. We want your suggestions for paint color, flooring, new signs. We need new signs. They need to be approved by the landlord. Lighting, backdrop for the front of the sanctuary. Um, we're going to need people to help process. We have applications for families who want to be part of this food program. Those, those applications have to be processed. So the cost of the lease, like I said, is 50% more. We can handle that. The cost of the food program is a little over $100 a month. That's it. We can handle that. The thrift store will easily provide the differential. So, um, and while the ministry grows, right? So look around this room. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. We're here for just through May. So today and then two more Sundays after that. June 2nd, and I've asked Susan, and she's got some other people who are going to hand out to you now a postcard that I had created and ordered, and um, it came, and it has the, uh, the address, the date, and on the back, there's a map, okay? So no excuses for getting lost, and uh, we are excited. God has blessed us abundantly. So take one of these with you today, and if there's, you only need one in your family, then give one to somebody else as an invitation. June 2nd is Housewarming Sunday. Okay, that's what I like calling it, Housewarming Sunday. And so if any of you have, so while I'm packing, I just bring out two boxes, and half the stuff goes in for the thrift store box, and the other half goes for my new home because my new home is about half the size of the one I'm in now. So it works perfect. It's really cool. Really glad. I mean, I was looking at lamps. And I'm going, what am I going to do with that lamp? I like that lamp. I don't have room for that lamp. Now it's going in the thrift store. So some of you start saving your money. I'm putting some pretty cool stuff out there. And there's a bargain. And all the money goes to the church. Isn't that cool? Only God. Only God comes up with such awesome ideas. So do you all have one now? Will you wave it in the air? Just hold it up there. Lord God. We lift up to you our new church home. And we thank you. We thank you for the blessing, the open door, for revealing this place, for picking it out just for us, a mission outpost from where people can have their hope renewed and they can rediscover they have a future with you. We ask for your blessing. I thank you for all these people, these children who love you. We want the Hope Center of Christ to be a home, a house that serves you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow. And you still get a message. You know, I was one of those young moms, had my hands full, four boys um, born within seven years' time. People said, Sheila, you're still sane. And I said, barely, but I am. Every now and then I've had it checked. <laughs> How am I doing? But one of the things I did was, and this is back in the days, now mind you, um, it wasn't that long ago, but technology, you know, we had car keys that actually open the door, they just stick in and unlock instead of you just push a button, right? And, um, and we had, didn't have cell phones. And I was constantly locking my keys in the car with those boys. It wasn't their fault, it was mine. And my poor husband was getting so tired of me calling him, I'd have to take the boys and go down to a payphone and call him and say, Jim, I'd have to get a secretary. She'd have to go get him. I'd say, Jim, I locked my keys in the car again. And there I was stranded with my boys at a, who knew where, you know, at, at school or at the grocery store. And my husband would have to come all the way from work, you know, a good 10 miles, you know, and unlock the car, give me my keys, and drive all the way back to work. Well, he got kind of tired of that. So he had came up with this really cool idea he got one of my car key, and he drilled a hole through it. He put it behind my license plate. Don't worry. It's not, we don't do it that way anymore, so I'm not worried about anybody stealing my car. But he, he, put, he put the screw to the license plate, and he screwed it back there so it was hidden. He said, now, 
You don't have to call me anymore. All you have to do is get a table knife. He knew that was my favorite tool. <laughs> all you need to do is get a table knife and unscrew the license plate, and you, you've got a key to the car at all times. You're now safe. I shudder to tell you how many times I had to go into a little store and say, can I borrow a table knife? <laughs> but I did. I did, and it was better than calling Jim. And I was sharing that story with my friend Susan. And Susan said, oh, Sheila, that's nothing. She said one day, she had three, three little ones. She said one day we were so busy, we were shopping, and it began to rain cats and dogs. It was a torrential downpour. And I was so tired of taking the kids and trying to go in. You know, have you ever tried to transport children in when it's torrential downpour, getting, getting out of the car, just walking into the store, then going back to the car? Everybody's getting wet, drenched. It's miserable, right? The feet are wet. Everything's wet and cold. And um, she said, finally, she said, it was lunchtime, and I was tired. The kids were tired, and I thought... I saw McDonald's, I said, let's go, let's go have some McDonald's. So we, they went in and they had McDonald's and she just, it was just kind of a nice respite. The rain was still out there pouring down, coming down in sheets, but they were warm and dry in McDonald's and enjoying their lunch. They got up to go back to the car and Susan started digging through her, book, her purse and she said, I couldn't find my car keys. And she said, I looked and looked and I looked in my pocket of my coat, and I looked in everywhere, no keys to be found, and she said, I had this horrible thought. I wonder if I threw them out with all of the food, all the food trash. So she called over, the, she said, now, Sheila, the really awful thing about this was that the president of PTA was sitting at the adjoining booth. She was the mom who had it all together, right? We all know moms like that that we want to look really good in front of. So Susan went and got the help from McDonald's staff, and they went and they dug through all the, meat, the greasy trash cans at McDonald's looking for Susan's keys. What a mess. What a mess. Finally, she said, maybe I left them in the car. <laughs> so they, there she was with her three, trooping out there, and it was still raining, raining, raining. She said, you'll never believe what I saw, Sheila. The car door was wide open, the keys were in the car, and the car was running. <laughs> so you know what? Sometimes we moms, you just got to give us a break, people. All right, we... <laughs> Some days, we have days where we just need people to give us a break, right? So, and these days, this is how I've been taking my break, when I feel like I finally have a moment where I can take a break, and I'm really confessing here today. I, re I take my break by, I, it, yes, I do read my Bible, yes, I do pray, but then I also like to watch Lost on Hulu. Any of you seen Lost, the TV show? And it's not that intellectual. It's not but that really inspiring, but it's a good distraction. And as I'm watching it, I'm seeing it's really a fairly accurate depiction of God's children when we are lost and far away from God. There's so many ways, times easy to lose things, and it's also easy to get lost. So I'm actually going to, since it's Mom's Day, I'm going to invite my oldest son, Jason, to come up and help me tell a story. So Jason, come on up. This is my oldest, Jason, my number one son, because he's going to tell a story of something that happened to him. I wasn't there, but I heard all about it. Jason, isn't he handsome? We moms like to brag about our kids. He's handsome and smart and sweet and, you know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. How old was I? I don't know. I was going to ask you. Okay. Four or five. When I was a young boy, it was my birthday, June 21st, the first day of summer, and my Aunt Gretchen, where is she? Where is Aunt Gretchen? There she is. And my Grandma Schuler got this great idea to take me to Knott's Berry Farm. And I was probably four or five. I was little. How old was he, Gretchen? Four or five? I think four. 
Yeah, I was little. Okay. <laughs> So I go to Knott's Berry Farm with two of my favorite people, my grandma and my beautiful aunt. And I'll never forget, we were eating lunch. I don't remember the restaurant. I haven't been there in a while. But after lunch, I started following someone who very closely resembled my Aunt Gretchen. <laughs> and I'm not sure how long I followed this woman. That's how I recall. This is how I remember the story. So, yeah, I'm following this woman that looks like my Aunt Gretchen for a while. And all of a sudden, I walk up, and I go up to grab her hand, and I look at her, and I go, uh-oh. <laughs> and that horrible feeling, like, took over my body. And I was like, I turned around, and it was strangers everywhere. And the mystery woman kept going with the crowd. And I just, I'm like, I am lost. And so I... I was smart enough to retrace my steps back to the restaurant, but they, I think, went to go look for me, so they weren't there anymore. So I sat down, and I, I probably cried, but I don't remember that. And then I do remember walking up to an employee, a waitress, and telling her, you know, I followed this woman, I'm lost, I've been the victim of negligent child supervision. <laughs> and... They took me to the Lost and Found, and I sat there for what felt like four or five hours playing with Snoopy toys. <laughs> but I was so happy when Gretchen and my grandma walked through the door, and they found me. Yes, woo, we did find, sorry, Jason. Yes, thank you, no, thank you. The reason I wanted Jason to share that story is not to put my mom on Mother's Day in a disparaging light. But because I wanted somebody to describe the feeling of what it feels like to be lost. And that's why I asked Jason to do it, because I couldn't do that. And didn't you feel, you know, feel for him, you know? And we've all had that from time to time. And we as parents, I'm sure my mom and my sister were absolutely beside themselves. They, were, they had to be. I mean, I, they were very, very apologetic. And I don't know that I ever let them take him to anywhere again. <laughs> after that, but uh, <laughs> he's a lawyer, can you tell? Anyway, so, but that feeling of being lost, lost, losing something, losing it. There are times when Jim and I, because we had the same problem, where we would look around the room and we we're like, where's our child? And they had slipped off to go to the restroom or something, and we didn't see them go, they didn't tell us, and your heart stops. If you lose something precious, your heart stops when you feel lost. And that's when you, when you face loss, when you are lost, when you've lost something, you need the way, the truth, and the life. Because we've been studying in the, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, getting to know him, and who did Jesus say he was? Not what somebody else says, not what scholars say even, not even what she, who Sheila or any other pastor say who Jesus was. Who did Jesus himself say he was, is? And he used the I am's to say that. He said, I am the bread of life and the living water. You will never thirst. You will never go hungry. Your life will be truly satisfied satisfied if I fill your life with me. He said, I am the light of the world. Even if you walk in darkness, I will be there. I will light your way for you. You can have life abundant, says Jesus. He said, I am the good shepherd. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will walk with you. I will lay down my life for my sheep. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though they die, they shall live. This is who Jesus is, life abundant today, here, and in the hereafter. He said, I am the true vine, and if you just abide in me, if you just rest in me, you will have eternal purpose. You will leave an eternal legacy 
a legacy that will outlive King Tut's tomb. An eternal, eternal legacy, divine purpose. That's who Jesus is. And today, we're looking at where he said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Aren't these words that people who feel lost or have suffered loss, isn't this the words of comfort they need? I am the way. Don't worry about the loss. Don't worry about not knowing your way. I am the way, said Jesus. And here's where he said it. In John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Ah, Anybody here come today with a troubled heart? Anybody know anybody today with a troubled heart? Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus was saying, as we've been learning, that he is God. He's equating himself with God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. In Hebrews 6, verse 19 and 20, it says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And we know that anchors were used in storms to keep the boats, the ships, from peril. Paul said, This hope. We have as an anchor of the soul a hope, both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Verse 20 says, Jesus has gone there ahead of us, and he is our high priest forever. The word, the Greek word used there for where it says, Jesus has gone there ahead of us, and Jesus has said, I will go to prepare a place for you. Jesus has gone on ahead of us. Jesus has gone on ahead of us. The Greek word is prodoma, prodromus. Prodromus translates to forerunner. He has run ahead of us. I think about, you know, you look at these trails. Even the other day, when my husband and I were driving up and down the coast, he said, Sheila, you know, you think about the fact that these, where many of the highways were once upon a time a trail. Well, who found the trail? Who led the trail? When you look at wagon train or any of those things, they always had a guide with them, right? Somebody who knew the way and didn't just give them directions, but went with them. Didn't just point them over the mountains, but went with them. And sometimes they would circle up the wagons and he would go on ahead and scout things out and make sure it was safe for them to continue on, right? That's like a prodromus. That's what that means. And it was used, the Roman troops had what they called reconnaissance troops who were also called prodromi. And they were sent out to scout spies to see what the army was going to face when they got there. Forerunners. And this I love too. Prodromus was also used to refer to the pilot boats that helped bring in the big corn ships at the Alexandria Harbor. The Alexandria Harbor was very perilous and very difficult, and it was hard for boats and ships to get in and out of there safely, and so the prodromi would go in ahead of t- away, and they were the pilot boats, so they could have safe entry. They've gone on ahead. Sometimes they would, these pilot boats would take the anchors of ships in stormy weather. It would be too perilous for the ships to even get into the harbor. And so the pilot boats would take the anchors and bring them in and drop anchor for them. That's what Jesus does for you and for me. When we are facing loss, when we are in stormy areas... 
when we have lost our way, we don't know where to turn. And believe me, I know that many of you feel that way because I hear about it. You ask me for prayer. You ask for pastoral guidance. You don't know which way to turn. You're lost. You're confused. You hear different voices. And a lot of times we're looking at making a choice be something bad and bad. Or we're making a choice be something good and good. It's difficult to know which way to go sometimes these days. Sometimes it may, it may be a marriage. It might be a child. You might have a child and you don't know. You're lost. They're lost and you're lost as to how to help them. It might be financial. You've got too many bills and not enough revenue, and you don't know the way out. When the, but the good news is that Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I've already gone there, says Jesus. I've already gone to heaven. I've already prepared a house for you. I've already taken your anchor and carried it with me, and I've planted it in heaven for you. So let not your heart be troubled. What a word from the Lord, from Jesus. I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus doesn't just give you directions. He comes and he walks beside you. He holds your hand. He says, careful, don't step there. If you trip, he picks you up. When your heart is broken, he carries you. But he's gone on ahead. He already knows the plan. He already knows the way. And he's just walking it with you. Isn't that good news? Wonderful, wonderful good news. The challenge is we are lost. Even so, we are lost. How did we end up lost? How did those people on Hulu lost end up lost? They ended up in the plane crash, and they ended up in some island way out in the wilderness. But how did we end up lost? It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. God made Adam, and God made Eve, and he made this beautiful world, and he planted in the garden trees. One tree was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God said, you know what? I've given you all this beautiful garden, all these beautiful fruits and vegetables to eat, all of this to enjoy. But guess what? This tree right here, do not eat of this tree. Stop. Don't go there. Stay away from it. It's, bad. it's not a good tree for you. Well, we all know that Satan came and he tempted Eve and she gave in and she ate the forbidden fruit. She took a bite from this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why did Eve do that? Was it the serpent's fault? He is partially to blame. But she had free will. She could have said to him, no, I'm not going to listen to you. She was tempted. What was her temptation? What was her sin? It was th thinking, first of all, she disobeyed God. But she disobeyed God because she thought she was just as smart as God. I don't need to listen to God. In fact, that's kind of what Satan was saying. Don't eat of that because God doesn't want you to. You're going to feel like you're equal with God, and God's trying to keep you suppressed down there, right? That was part of what, how he took his rationale for her. No. She thought she could outsmart God. Hmm. Any of you ever done that? Any of you ever thought, oh, I don't need God? I don't need his, I don't need his, his direction. I'm just, I can do this. I'm smart. God created me with his brilliant, intelligent mind. Who needs God's wisdom? When we tr think we can outsmart God, we bite of that forbidden fruit, and guess what? 
you're lost. And you look around and you go, where am I? Now what am I going to do? The world is crashing in on me. I've lost something precious. Well, the, we have a fork in the road sometimes. We all face it. Sometimes it's a pivotal time in our life, but I think we do it all the time. Even those of us who've chosen to follow God, every single day, from moment to moment, we come to a fork in the road. And I want you to imagine I'm walking up, and here's the fork in the road. I can go this direction, or I can go that direction. And I have to choose. It's, I can't go down there. There's no middle of the road. There's no fence for me to sit on. I have to go right or left, this way or that way. This way says, is called, if there is a sign there, obey God. This sign says, don't obey God. Oh, it's that simple. It's really that simple. Are you going to listen to God and go his way? Or are you going to think you know better? Or just forget about him, or just don't give him the time of day, and just say, I don't need him. I'm going to go this way. I'm going to disobey God. I'm going to go my own way. So you can go God's way or your way. God's way or your way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. You'll be tempted, if you haven't already, those academicians, Scholars who will try to tell you that if you believe in absolute truth, you are not an intellectual, that there is no such thing as absolute truth, that all truth is relative and all truth changes depending on what they find and they discover as they're doing their research. I heard it all the time in my graduate programs. There is no such thing as absolute truth. But Jesus said, no, 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 I am the truth. I am the truth. I am the absolute truth. I am absolutely true. And I am the same yesterday and to today and forever because that's what truth is. Truth is a, is a verifiable fact. It's a proven, proven truth that stands the test of time and is eternally true, eternally true. Jesus is eternally true. So this eternal truth says, this is my way. My way leads to life. My way leads to being happy and joyful. Why wouldn't you want to go that way? So here we are, lost. I would truly believe that even if Eve hadn't indulged in the forbidden fruit, we all would have if we were in her shoes. I, I don't think it's fair to blame this all on one person. We all do it all the time. We think we can outsmart God and we partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and find ourselves lost. If you were God, and you created this beautiful garden, and you gave it to your children, and you said, enjoy, dwell. This is, I've lavished this upon you. But the children said, especially it's you who are parents, you know what this might feel like, but your children said, eh, well, I don't need your help. I don't need to listen to you. Basically, thumb your nose at God and say, I'm going to just do it anyway. I'm going to rebel, and I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good of evil, even though you told me not to. Well, if you were God, wouldn't you just kind of turn your back on that child? Be tempted to. To say, oh, you know what? They're not going to listen to me. They aren't going to follow me. I've already given them everything they have. Why? I'm not going to bother with them anymore. But God didn't 
do that. God said, I love you anyway. You see, there was another tree. Now, some scholars disagree whether it's one tree or two trees. I don't, the idea is, it mentions it in the Bible. There was another tree in the garden, the tree of life. And after they, they bit the apple, so to speak. They partook of the forbidden fruit and they were plunged into the abyss of death. Loss of life. Lost of way. God put a cherubim in front of the tree of life and he said, they can't, they can't eat it. This one's off limits now. Tree of life is off limits. But then, he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus came, and Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I go there ahead of you to prepare a place for you. And I've already secured an anchor there for you. Because you see, the cross on which Jesus died paid for all of our rebellion. And that cross of Jesus Christ builds a bridge back with us to God. That cross of Jesus Christ points us in the right direction. That cross of Jesus Christ brings us back when we have veered off course, back onto the way that God wants for you because it is a beautiful, beautiful way. And that cross of Jesus Christ is frequently called the tree of life. The tree of life. And because of the cross of Jesus, Jesus hung on the cross, that tree of life, when Jesus died, the veil was rent. And suddenly, there we have now access to God. Access to life. The promise of life, abundant and eternal. I want to close with reading a little story from a book I wrote called Mommy Grace, Erasing Your Mommy Guilt. Because some of you are saying, okay, lots of talk about trees and fruit and this and that, but how does that apply to me today? It was after my sons were all out of the house that I entered a doctoral program. In the process, I became conditioned to checking my email every night before going to bed. I had formed friendships with other doctoral students in the program as we encouraged one another through the grueling process. But I was unprepared for the email that popped up in my inbox that evening. It was from a young father I had met in my doctoral program, and the email was titled simply, My Mother. Kurt, his name, Kurt wrote, Sheila, never in a million years did I think I would be writing you to ask this favor of you. My mother was diagnosed four months ago with stage four brain cancer. She has maybe a few weeks to live. She does not have a church home. Could you help arrange a service for her? It would mean so much to me. I wiped the tears from my eyes, and I wrote back immediately, of course I would help him make these arrangements. I also told him I would be happy to bring a pastor to visit and pray with her. The next morning, there was a voicemail on my cell. It was from Kurt's wife. Sheila, could you please bring a pastor soon? Mom hasn't had anything to eat or drink in two days. It won't be much longer. I called Bob Cavender, a pastor at our church. It was his day off. It's okay, Sheila. If you feel God is prodding us to go today, I will go with you. When we got there, 
I saw Kurt. His eyes were red from crying, as were his wife's, his brother's, his father's. Behind a screen in the living room lay his mother, Julia. The screen that shielded her bed was papered with an assortment of colorful get well cards. It was obvious this was a woman who was well loved. Kurt and his brother told Bob and me stories of their mother, her love of the ocean, and how much she loved her two boys. Kurt told us how she had taught them how to surf when they were little. Even though her hair was gone, she still looked beautiful. There was not a wrinkle on her soft, transparent skin. Her cheeks were full and plump and even rosy, but her eyes were closed, and she gave no indication she knew we were there. I said to Kurt, do you mind if I pray for your mom? His voice choked, a tear slid down his cheek. He could merely nod. I placed my hand on her soft, bald head. I had expected the stubble to be prickly, but it felt like the fuzz of a newborn baby. A lump welled up in my throat. I swallowed hard and with great effort began to recite the 23rd Psalm as my head remained softly touching Julia's head. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord God, cradle your precious daughter, Julia. Hold her in your arms. Prepare her for her final homecoming. Comfort her sons and her husband who grieve losing their beloved mother and wife. We love her, Lord. Thank you for her amazing life, her treasured sons. I haltingly said the psalm and the prayer, and then I heard the sobs from grown men, her boys. When I turned to face them, they were weeping openly, grieving over the imminent loss of their mom. I held Kurt in my arms, and I said, would you like Bob to baptize your mom? Wiping tears from a drenched face, he said, yes. We always thought we would get baptized and it kept getting put off and put off and put off. We never got it done. We well, would like that very much. Then Kurt leaned over his mom and he said, mom, would you like to be baptized? Amazingly, Julia's startling blue eyes popped open with clarity. She looked right at him, and with a surprisingly strong voice, she said, Yes. Bob leaned over and asked her, Julia, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you repent of your sins and promise to live for him? Yes. Dipping his fingers in the bowl of water, he made a transparent, glistening cross on her forehead. I baptize you, Julia, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even though we were all stunned by the beauty of what we had just witnessed, Bob turned to Kurt and the others in the room and said, Would you guys like to be baptized as well? Yes. We would love to be baptized. Bob said, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? With tears running down their cheeks, they said, yes. Do you repent and promise to live for him? Yes. Dipping his fingers into the bowl, Bob etched a cross of water on each of their foreheads, saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
John, the second son, had been looking quietly on, and Bob said, Would you like to be baptized? John looked down, shuffled his feet, said, No, I'm okay. See, he stood there at that fork, right? Stood there at that fork. Said, No, I'm okay. We put the bowl down on the coffee table and had some more time talking, but John was tense as we continued to reassure them of their mother's salvation and the fact she was now ready to make her final homecoming. (sighs) We turned to leave, and John suddenly said, Wait, please, I want to be baptized too. So Bob picked up the bowl. He smiled at John and asked him, Do you, John, believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Tears running in rivulets, his lips trembled, and he said, Yes. Do you repent and promise to live for him? Yes. Then I baptize you, John, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amazingly, Throughout her baptism and the baptisms of her sons, Julia watched intently from her deathbed. Unable to lift her head, she followed us with her eyes throughout the small room. But when Bob baptized John, said amen, Julia's eyes closed for the last time. We heard later that she lived two more days. As Kurt walked me to the car, a colleague from a doctoral program, his words choked with tears. He said, thank you, Sheila, for bringing God to my home. I had been thinking this is the end. Now I see. It was just the beginning. Amen. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, Lord Jesus, wow. (laughs) We, your rebellious children, who sometimes think we know better than you, how silly. There are times we stand there at that fork of the road and We look, and there's your way and our way, and sometimes we go our way. And then when we see that we're lost, and suddenly we're afraid, our hearts begin to pound. We turn, and we look around, and we are lost. We don't know where we are. We don't know how the way out of this mess we find ourselves in. And then we look, and there you are, holding out your hand and saying, I am the way. Take my hand and let me lead you to life. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, today there are people here who need to say, forgive me, Father, for going my own way. I choose to follow you today. I want to take a hold of your hand, and I want to walk your way. And if I should stray, get me by the hand and pull me back. Thank you for hanging on the tree of life. Thank you, Jesus. My heart needs never be troubled because of you. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time today, everybody's eyes are closed. Nobody will look except me. But if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, will you just raise your hand so we can see and we can know and we can pray for you? You never let Jesus in your life before, but you did today. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we know you. Thank you that escrow has closed on our mansion in heaven. Amen.
Would you stand now for the benediction? Because you have good news. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his grace. May he lift up his countenance before you and give you that peace that passes all understanding. May he give you that faith that is unshakable, a hope that is unsinkable, and a love that is unquenchable. Follow the way. Be blessed in Jesus today. Amen. Hope Center, we are on the countdown to go over Jordan and into our home. We're going to sing that as we go out. Over Jordan, over Jordan, we will cross into the promised land of God. Over Jordan, over Jordan, we will cross week.